This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. I'm Java Chapman here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today, we're getting ready to venture out on the mighty Mississippi River with the owner and operator of Blue Cat Guide Service, Bob Crosby. Bob fishes the deep holes, deep channels, ledges, and drop-offs for big blues and recently started a cooperative project with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks to tag and track these big fish. So later in the show, we're going to talk with Larry Bull, Assistant Director of Fisheries, about the data they've collected so far. And as always, Dr. Troy Major is ready for your pet questions. And I want to remind you that if you happen to miss Creature Comforts on Thursday, it now repeats every Saturday morning at 6 a.m. You can always listen back to the podcast. Uh, Good morning, Libby and Dr. Major. How are you doing this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Yes, I'm filling in today. Kevin is out. Um, And just, I guess, full disclosure, he's been planning these kind of excursions for a while. But during uh, the age of COVID, every time he planned something, it kind of gets shut down, but now he finally uh, <laughs> was able to uh, make it out and uh, and socially distance, uh, distantly get away. So I'm filling in this morning for Kevin, but uh, it's always good to talk with you, Libby and Dr. Troy, on this side of on this side of things. So I'll go ahead and uh, start things off. Libby, you always give us a interesting report, and last week we talked about the um, of the. Uh, uh, birds and the frogs with, um, oh, I'm having a brain thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's been a whole week. Who was I? Who who was I? Guess last week, uh, Libby. <laughs> well, you know what I was going to talk about a little bit this morning is uh, parental care of baby birds. We've all we've been talking about birds a lot because so many people are watching birds and feeding birds during this isolation time that uh, seems like a good thing for us to talk about on the air. And uh, watching uh, a group of little chickadees fledge uh, the other day made me start thinking about how attentive the parents were. So I did a little more reading. I knew there, there are two kinds basically of of baby birds, some species are what they call altricial, and they're, uh, I guess, sort of like human babies are. They're very weak. They uh, can't control their body temperature very well, almost not at all. So the parents have to warm them. They have to feed them. They're uh, blind and wobbly and uh, featherless when they're born. And that's most of the songbirds. So a lot of the little birds that we're watching in our yards and that uh, we have in our nesting boxes, those babies are very weak and their parents are having to take care of them for usually a couple of weeks intensively. They've, you know, anywhere from like 10 to 15 days, maybe they've sat on the eggs and that may be mostly the female, although sometimes the males do that too. So now they're having to care for them intensively for a couple of weeks and protect them. But then there's another kind of baby bird. Some species are precocial. And those babies are kind of like a baby chicken would be in that they hatch out with feathers. As soon as those feathers dry off, they are able to move around and follow the parents, start learning to eat. They're just um, able to take care of themselves. They are precocious. They are able to take care of themselves much better than the altricial birds, but they still need a lot of protection. So with those, it's mainly ground nesting birds and birds that are water birds that nest around the water. I suppose, um, That's kind of an evolutionary feature. If you were a weak little baby on the ground, you might not last very long and would not. So anyway, that's a kind of a fun thing to think about which birds are uh, engaged in what kind of activity right now in our yards. The herons and the egrets are an exception, even though we consider them to be water associated birds. Those babies are very helpless and weak when they're young. So those parents are having to um, do the same as a songbird would and uh, take care of them completely. 
And yeah, I just looked it up. Like you said, Libby, it has been a whole week. And um, Doc, um, uh, we had Joe McGee on the show just last last week, friend of the program, and he said up uh, talking about things that were disappearing disappearing from the morning chorus and the evening chorus of the birds and the frogs and the insects and things. And it just made me start paying attention a little bit more, like in the mornings when I hear certain birds, and in the night when you hear the insects and the frogs and things. You know what's missing and what's and and what is there and um that just made me um you know recognize from last week but before we get into these phone calls dr trey major we have some uh calls some pet calls lined up i can see but i want to say a thank you uh to those who send in those emails animals at mpbonline.org especially with the pictures and a special thank you to reba from uh tibba creek who sent in some pictures of another bird that we talked about just a couple of weeks ago, the pro prothonotary warblers, those uh, beautiful yellow birds and Libby, I know you saw those pictures and, uh, and commented back to her. Oh yes, yeah. She had a great picture of uh, a prothonotary that was nesting in uh, a strange little bird box. that looked like a, maybe a 1950s kind of a camper and it was definitely just a decorative kind of thing and you know I had talked about that they they nested in some unusual things at my house well hers was really funny it had a little flamingo toy on the birdhouse and so she got a picture of the prothonotary setting and as though it was so happy to be face to face just head to head with the little flamingo in the yard so it was really cute Dr. Major, what are you what are you seeing from your from your vantage point um, at your house? Oh, let's see, plenty of deer. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they're beginning to uh, browse pretty roughly on some of the stuff I've got in the yard. Uh, I guess the dry has made a difference. It's been dry lately, but anyway, plenty of deer uh, here in the Cardinals. Uh, they're still singing, and uh, probably the tit mice are making some noise. But always we have some crows out that way, so we hear crows. But usually when the crows are making a lot of noise, they're harassing uh, owls, which we have owls as well. So we're still hearing some owls call uh, occasionally. But, uh, you know, it's just uh, summertime. Yeah, and we course, can. And mockingbird. We, can... we have plenty of mockingbirds, so sometimes it's difficult to tell who's calling when the mockingbird is talking. <laughs> and we even see I know um uh several times I've seen deer right here on the uh, on the MPB property out here uh, off Lakeland Drive Metro Jackson so yes uh Dr. Major the deer are um are about but let's uh, go to the phone lines like I said we have some uh pet calls I see lined up and let's start with uh Sheila in South Haven and uh she has a question this morning good morning Sheila Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I really love this show, and I appreciate what you do so much. Thank you. I have you. a question about, um, I have a cat. She's a run-of-the-mill animal shelter tabby cat, and she's 16 years old, and she's had a lot of um, in, um, stomach issues lately, and it seems like she's losing control. Um, she's becoming incontinent and losing control of her bowel movements. And no matter what food I try, I've switched her from dry food to wet food um, with some pumpkin mixed in. Um, and I've also um, had her express. It's not seeming to give her any relief. Um, and I'm not sure what direction I need to go in because she's 16 and I don't want to put her through any unnecessary testing. I understand. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the problems, of course. And how long... Tell me how long has she been having this uh, incontinence or irritable bowel, I guess would be the, the best way to put it. Um, so about how long three or four months. Going on? Okay. Have you tried uh, any type of uh, probiotic or anything along that line? No, I have not. Okay. may help. Some of the cats, I'm, I'm just going to lay this out kind of as best I can. Some of the cats respond to that. Others respond to maybe some prednisolone. Uh, and and that helps in a lot of cases. There's a food that's relatively new that you might want to try. I think it's in canned and dry, and it's called Biome, B-I-O-M-E. And we've seen some good results with some of the cats with with uh, diarrhea or incontinence. So you might want to try that and see. 
Uh, you okay. probably have to get a prescription from your vet, but it's B I O M E, and it's made by uh, Hills Prescription Diet. So you might want to try that. Okay, wonderful. Okay. I hope it helps. Uh, thank okay. you so much for taking my call. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, for calling in today. And let's continue on the phones, and let's go to V in Wayne County with another another pet question. Good uh, good morning, V. Good morning. I have an eight-month-old puppy um, with a loose stool. I've been giving him um, Pepto mixed in with his Serena dog child, the dried food. Right. And it, it doesn't seem to help. There's just a, a loose stool. Right. Can you help? Okay. Okay, I'll try. What about uh, has he been checked for intestinal parasites and been dewormed? Not lately. Okay. You might want to get a stool sample or take him into your vet and get us get it checked to be sure that he has no intestinal parasites. The other thing I would think it might be good at this time to switch to another puppy food just to see if you get an improvement um, in in his bowel movements, okay? Okay. Uh, it doesn't seem to bother the other dogs. It's just right. this particular one. They, they right. Eat the same and he food. may be more sensitive. Eight months old, did you say? He's about eight, nine months old dog, okay. yeah. Uh-huh. Let's get him checked again Checked again for intestinal parasites just to be sure that that's not the cause. And uh, I would consider switching to a different puppy food just to be sure that it's not something he's developed a and sensitivity to uh, on that particular food. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, best best of luck on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, V, for um, calling in this morning. And if you have a question, um, we're going to join. I add Bob Crosby uh, from Big Guide Blue Catfish um, Blue Cat guide service onto the conversation after this break but dr major is here for your pet questions and also libby hartfield is ready to help you um with any other of your other brushes with nature so make sure you join the show one eight seven seven mpb ring that's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four or you can send an email to animals at mpb online.org well like i said we're going to add bob crosby from a blue cat a guide service onto the show after the break but i do have a question what is mississippi's official state fish and no it's not catfish so tune in for the answer This is Creature Comforts right here on MPB Think Radio. Hey, this is Malcolm White with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Every week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. You're listening to MPB Think Radio, and this is Creature Comfort. Some Java Chapman filling in for Kevin Farrell this morning here with some of my good friends, Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. And now we are joined by Bob Crosby, owner and operator of Blue Cat Guide Service. And we're going to talk about some of the catfish of the state. And I don't know if these are the edibles. Um, we'll get into that, but I, this is, these are not the little ones that go on the plate, not the fillets. I'm talking about some of the big catfish found around the state in the Mississippi River, the big the big boys. And if you want to join the show, one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. 672 7464 Or you can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Good morning, Mr. Crosby. How are you doing today? Fine, sir. Thanks for having me. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have had you on the show before. Um, but just in case um, 
uh, somebody, this is their first time hearing of you. Uh, tell us about Blue Cat God Service and um, how you got to be the angler that you are today. Well, I've been fishing on the Mississippi River shoot, for 20 or 25 years or so. And uh, eight years ago, I just decided I'd like to try to um, take people out of, in the guide service. And I said, decided if I liked it, I'd stick with it. If I didn't, I would quit. And that was eight years ago, and I'm uh, having a ball. Okay, well, I know the people who go out on the on the water are um, are thrilled with you because, like you said, for for eight years you've been doing it. And um, what what mainly are you are you fishing for when you uh, when you go out? Well, we're fishing mainly for catfish. We specialize in catfish, and we call them the trophy catfish. And uh, we started something new. Um, we're doing a a fish tagging service with the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, we're tagging catfish, releasing them, and uh, hoping somebody will catch them and um, call in, and uh, that way we can determine some the movement, the growth, and um, and just uh, what, what these big catfish do. Yeah, no, we're gonna we're gonna bring uh, Larry, <clears throat> excuse me, Larry Bull, assistant director of uh, the fisheries, onto the show in just a little bit because this is a cooperative program between uh, you, Blue Cat Guide Service, and the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And when you say the catfish, I believe they come, um, I, I guess, in say different types. You have the flatheads, the blue, and the channel. Yes, sir. There's uh, all. We mainly catch the blue catfish and the uh, the flathead or the Appaloosa catfish. Uh, we catch very few channel cat in the river. I'm told that the channel cat are more stream and river fish, small river fish, lake fish. But we, we do catch a few, but I'd say probably 75% of the fish catfish would catch are blue cat, and uh, then we, the rest of them are mainly uh, the the flatheads. And what's the what's what's the weight on this? I know you say you're tagging them and trying to keep keep a track on them. What's the what's the I guess the average weight of these fish? Because these are the I know the record is almost ninety something pounds of a catfish caught in the Mississippi River. Yes, sir. Uh, unless it's uh, changed, the record on the blue cat is ninety five pounds. Oh, okay. But we're tagging we're, we're tagging uh, twenty pound and larger catfish, blue cat and flatheads. And uh, I think so far, I've got a friend in North Mississippi that guides on the Mississippi River. Uh, he's tagging also David Magnus with a uh, cat and round guide service. So we've got catfish scattered from, um, that's tagged fish from Vicksburg to Tunica or so, even up the Mississippi, Tennessee line, but we're tagging 20 pound or larger and the largest so far we've tagged is a 72-pounder and also a 62-pounder. So we've got every fish from 72 pounds to 20 pounds tagged in the Mississippi River, hoping somebody will catch them and call in and um, so again so we can get the, the data. Now I haven't I haven't been out on the Mississippi River to fish in the, I don't know the last time I put bait on the hook which has been some time but um what type of what type of uh, bait are you using or lures to get these these big these big guys Uh we fish mainly with skipjack herring it's kind of a bait fish but also fish with um shad shad's of excellent bait but um shoot, you know catfish um a lot of people use uh, shrimp, uh, chicken livers. Uh, there's just a variety of baits, but we mainly use uh, the skipjack, herring, and uh, shad. Okay. Now, do we know why the the Mississippi River is home to these? Just, I mean, these these un- enormous, or is that part of what we're trying to find out with the tagging? Yeah. Uh, I think that, well, Larry Bullock can answer this question, but I think they've done tagging before on um, small catfish. And I think they want to try to find out uh, the, the movements and the patterns of the, the big catfish. And uh, there's nowhere 
around that has the size catfish of the Mississippi River, you know, it takes a long time to grow a 40 or 50 pound catfish. And, you know, the, the Mississippi River is so big and uh, there, there are vast stretches of the Mississippi River that probably never gets fished. You know, there's boat ramps maybe 30, 40, even further miles apart. So they just got time to get big and grow big and we've got a good food source in the Mississippi River. Now, when you when you take people out on the well, let me let me ask this question, Libby. Have you ever been out with uh with Bob on the, on the Blue Cat Guide service? Is Libby there? <laughs> well, Bob, Bob, have you ever? Hey, t- no, I have, I have not been able to do that. Paul's gone with him, but I haven't done it yet. Oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, Bob, when people first come out um, with you on the on the, on uh, on the guide, what what are some of the safety tips that you that you tell them? Because I can imagine, like I said, I haven't fished in a while, but trying to bring in something that big is, is you got to know what you're doing. Yes, sir. We use a uh, big tackle. Um, uh, the first thing we stress is safety. We always wear a life jacket. I've got a big spacious. 21 foot boat that I fish out of with a 200 horsepower motor on it, so it's very adequate for the Mississippi River. But um, yeah, it's just been trial and error, so I've just uh, developed my tackle, um, developed the techniques, and um, it's just a different system fishing the Mississippi River than it is, you know, a lake or a stream. It just takes different tackle and different tactics. We're fishing such deep water. We'll fish anywhere up to 100 feet deep, and with that fast current, you need, you know, you need a lot of weight. Sometimes we'll use uh, normally we use six and eight ounce weights, but sometimes we'll put two eight ounce weights on. Sometimes it takes a pound of weight to hold it on the bottom in that fast current. Yes, sir. I can. I can only imagine if you're out there on that on that raging Mississippi. Um, we're talking with Bob Crosby this morning from Blue Cat Guide Service, and uh, he takes individuals out and fishes for the for the big for the big fish. I like to call them the big boys, the big catfish, the flatheads, the blue. And uh, he's also joined in with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks for a cooperative project where they're tagging and tracking these catfish. So you uh, you alluded to it earlier. Earlier, you're actually looking for help from people on the water um, when they come across these tag these tagged catfish. What should what should a, a person do if they come across one? Well, these tags have the uh, Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks phone number on it, and um, when we catch them, uh, we're documenting their weight, the date we catch them, the specific location, uh, and the length. So. Um, if somebody catches their the bright little yellow tags, um, strong little yellow plastic tags, so if somebody catches one, uh, we're, we're sure hoping they'll call in and uh, report where they caught it, the weight and the length. And um, again, the phone number's on the tag, so uh, they'll have the phone number there when they catch the fish. Okay. Well, like I said, um, we're here with Bob Crosby from Blue Cat Guide Service. And just after this break, we're going to add Larry Bull, Assistant Director of the Fisheries Bureau with the Wildlife Service, as they are together tagging and tracking these catfish and looking for your help if you're out there on the water. So join the conversation this morning by calling one 877 MPB ring. That's one 672 If you have a question about catfish or maybe a pet question for Dr. Major. Also, don't forget about the email animals at mpbonline.org. We'll have more after the break, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. You're listening to Creature Comforts here on MPB Think Radio. I'm Java Chapman here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Mississippi Animal Medical Center of Jackson. And 
Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. We've been talking with Bob Crosby from Blue Cat Guide Service, and we are now going to bring into the conversation Larry Bull. He is the assistant director of fisheries for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And as we have been talking, they are in partnership um, working on tagging and tracking some of the big, the, I just got to say it, the big boys of the Mississippi River, uh, some of the catfish. Uh, good morning, Mr. Bull. How are you doing today, sir? Yes, good morning. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, helping us out here on Creature Comforts. Um, before the break, Bob was talking about the project uh, tagging the catfish of the Mississippi River. So um, how did this uh, this whole thing uh, come about? Well, I think Bob kind of uh, expressed an interest with uh, uh, Jack Kilgore, who works with the Corps of, Corps of Engineers, and he was interested in tagging some fish and uh we got involved when we were asked if we could provide the tags, and uh, we agreed to so so that uh, we could collect some data from the fish. Okay, what um I know Bob was saying that we were trying to track the uh, how far they travel and um, I guess the the continuing weight of the of the fish. What what type of uh, tags are being used to identify these fish? Okay, there's what are called a floy anchor bar tags and they're uh and bob may have described them i wasn't able to listen to the early the show the show earlier uh but uh they look like a kind of a noodle a spaghetti noodle and they're uh yellow in color but they're inserted into the back of the fish and they have a a, a phone number when they when a, a, a person catches the fish because you guys are asking for help from people who fish the river uh, to call the number. They have a, a, a specific number and a tracking code or something. That's correct. Each each uh, tag has a unique number, and uh, Bob and uh, they're inserting two tags in that uh, each fish that they catch and tag. Uh, like you said, it does include the phone number. We ask uh, anglers if, if or whoever may re, you know, recapture one of those fish to give us a call. Uh, we're really interested in knowing, um, obviously, the tag numbers on the fish and uh, the total length and the uh, the recapture location where the fish was was recaptured, so that we can kind of determine how far it may have moved. Now, Bob, I know you say you take the um, the the your people who go on the service with you, and you guys are uh, fishing for the trophy fish. It, do you have to throw the fish back so it can continue to be tracked, or do you can you keep the fish and put it on your wall? I mean, I don't. <laughs> oh, you you mean uh, the fish? Well, we, no we, one re- oh, go ahead, go I'm ahead, sorry. Larry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. The the fish that are recaptured, okay. the angler. The angler can keep it if he wants to, or he can throw it back. That's really his choice. Okay, Bob. Yeah, uh, Bob. What were you What were you going to say? I was going to say, yeah, we return all the fish that we catch. You know, that we tag to the water, of course, release them. But uh, as Larry was saying, uh, when somebody catches it, it's, it's their fish. We just hope we'll uh, be provided with the data. Okay, so the yeah the number I just kind of want to uh, make that clear because like I said, you guys go out and you are looking for these trophy fish and you know you can make up all kind of stories if you don't have the fish, but uh, with them being tagged, just make sure that you catch the fish, call the service, record the data, and then it's up to the specific angler if they want to keep the fish or uh, throw it back. Yes, sir. All right. Well, Larry, how long do these tags last? Is it a lifetime thing? Well, the tags themselves are made out of plastic, so they they have a pretty long lifespan. However, um, it's it's pretty common that over time the fish will lose the tags. They'll just shed them uh, for various reasons. So um, I was looking, it just depends on, so we expect some tags, you know, to fall off early on, and and um, I'm just trying to remember. I, uh, I sent Bob some information about this. I think somebody somebody did a study where they looked at this, and after about four months or so, three to four months, 
about 24 percent, 25 percent of the tags have been lost. So that's just that's not uncommon for the fish to lose the tags. And and one reason we've asked Bob to um, tag put two tags in each fish is so that we can kind of get an estimate of the tag loss rate. So that if an angler catches a fish with one tag, we can do some calculations and try to determine how quickly they are losing tags. But uh, it's not uncommon. Then we've all, you know, in the past years, we've tagged largemouth bass and Ross Barnett Reservoir, for example, and we've had tagged fish recaptured three or four years later. So some of the tags will stay in, in some of the fish for a long time. Okay, how many, about, about, I guess, a rough estimate, if you don't have the exact number, uh, how many fish have been, been tagged so far? Is it just uh, the the river is just full of all these tag fish? Yeah, I think between um, David Magnus in North Mississippi that's tagging and myself, I believe we tagged over 70 fish, over 70 catfish so far. And we started back in March. So since March, we've tagged uh, 70 plus catfish over 20 pounds. And how long will you continue to tag the fish? Oh, shoot. I hope we can, this program, uh, as long as um, the Department of Wildlife and Fishers and Parks will put up with me, I'd like to just <laughs> do it indefinitely. <laughs> okay, well, I, I know that will yield a yield a lot of data. Um, what, Larry? Do we have a? Uh, I guess uh, any any uh, good good data um, from these taggings yet? Like, I guess the 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 length that the fish travel or um, something like that. Well, we we have not had any recapture reported to us, so we don't know if anybody. No one has called us and said, "Hey, we've caught a a tag catfish yet." Okay, well, yep. we need we we need we need those anglers out there. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the, the tags are so obvious, and I think somebody if they, they'd be so curious and excited, I'm sure they would call in. So um, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to getting some some uh, response and some data from the recaptured fish. Bob, what kind of, because you were, uh, I guess, the brainchild for this, what kind of data are you looking for um, uh, like um, to see how far they travel or what's their kind of um, uh, uh, habit, yeah, habits I, and I things? I would like to know how far they travel. You know, if we capture and release a fish in, say, Vicksburg, um, it'd be interesting to know how far they travel. And also, to me, it'd be exciting. I've always wondered how old these fish are, so, so how fast they grow. So say we release a 20-pound fish today, and uh, somebody catches it two years from now, we'll know how much it grew. So we'll kind of have a benchmark on how fast these big fish grow. So that'll, that, that's exciting to me, to trying to learn how fast these fish grow, how much weight they put on. Now, is it something about that 20 pounds? Because I know you guys don't track anything less than 20 pounds. Right, right. Uh, when I talked to Larry, he said he wanted to do trophy fish. And um, I don't know, we kind of put our heads together and decided to do 20 pounds or larger. Is that number uh, kind of significant, Larry? Uh, well, it's just. It's, it's getting up there in size, you know. I mean, obviously, Bob's catching a bunch of two, two and three pound fish. He'd run out of tags pretty quick, and, and we're just like, like Bob had said, we're we're interested in the movement and the growth of the larger fish. So we just felt like twenty pounds was a, was a good starting place. Okay, it looks like we um we have a caller before our next break. It is uh, Susan in Hattiesburg, and uh, she has a question about the the catfish. Susan, good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for taking my call. I um, am a zooarchaeologist. I uh, analyze animal bones from archaeological sites, and uh, we have a comparative collection here at USM. And I'm just curious. We've got both uh, blue cats and uh, flatheads that are a meter long, but um, but we don't have any really big uh, channel cats. And I'm wondering how large is the largest channel cat you've ever caught 
Go ahead, Larry. Um, yeah, Larry can answer that probably better than I can. Well, the state record cat channel catfish for Mississippi was caught at Lake Tom Bailey, which is one of our state fishing lakes just east of Meridian. And if I'm not mistaken, it was about 56 pounds. Okay, so you don't know how long it was. Oh, no, ma'am, I don't. Not off. Okay, because that's what we record for our specimens is the length. You know, we do standard and um, fork length. Um, well, anyway, well, I'll, I'll sit down and see if I can figure that out. But I'm sure that we have got both um, flatheads and blue cats that are way bigger. <clears throat> anyway, well, thank you so much for taking my call. Well, we appreciate you joining us uh, this morning, Susan, and um, keep up the good work at USM collecting those those bones and, and things. I think it's time for our next break. We're going to uh, continue talking with Larry and Bob about this cooperative project. They're looking for anglers. They're looking for your help. If you're catching those catfish on the Mississippi River, you come across the bright yellow tags. They need you to call in and record the data, and we're going to get some more information from Larry and Bob about how you can do that. So make sure you do stay tuned if you want to join today's show one eight seven seven mpb ring that's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four or you can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org we'll be back to wrap up the show after this hi i'm dr jimmy stewart professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the university of mississippi medical center On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. You're listening to MPB Think Radio, and this is Preacher Comfort. I'm Java Chapman here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest for the day, Bob Crosby from Blue Cat Guide Service, and Larry Bull, Assistant Director of Fisheries at the Mississippi Wildlife Fisheries and Parks. Uh, We've been talking about a project that they have where they're attacking the catfish and looking for your help, and we have a question about tagging the fish. Uh, we have John, who's on the road. Uh, good morning, John. Go ahead with your question. Good morning. Um, I was just wondering if um, I was a hunter and fisher in Michigan for years growing up, and uh, now I live down in lower Alabama. Uh, I do it when I can as I'm an over-the-road truck driver. But uh, I've seen these programs in the past, not for fish. Uh, but I was wondering if to give incentive to the anglers to maybe actually put the fish back uh, to where they could be recaptured again uh, would maybe be a map online where you could log in and look at your fish that you caught and maybe be able to see the trail of you know where other anglers may or may not have caught that fish just to see migration and and uh, the progression of the fish. I was wondering if that might be an incentive for them to actually put the fish back. Well, we appreciate that comment. Um, John, is that something that you guys kind of thought about when you were uh, putting this program together? I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> hey, Bob, is this something that you guys were uh, thinking about? Yes, I think exactly what he was saying. Yeah, you know, we're wanting to find out the, the migration patterns, how far they travel, um, and, you know, how much weight they put on during the um, the time that they were first released and recaptured. Well, so, yes, uh, if, that's if what we're trying, made, trying to determine. If information was made available online uh, where somebody could actually see, you know, quote-unquote, their fish, the one that they caught, and be able to watch it progression, it might actually incentivize them to uh, release the fish in hopes that somebody else would capture the fish and they would be able to see the progression of that fish as well. Larry, is there something in yeah. place where, the, where where people can kind of, like you said, see their fish or, you know, they caught fish A um, right off of Vicksburg and they're trying to see, you know, if somebody else caught the fish? Is there a place online for people to track that? We, we haven't put that together, but that's uh, something that we might consider. I, I was having a hard time hearing the questions and comments, but uh, 
from that individual, but that's something that we could consider doing. Okay, well, we appreciate that suggestion, John. You um, continue listening. You you may have uh, sparked the sparked the flame of inspiration. <laughs> yeah. I listen to you guys all over the United States. I've got a podcast of you, so I love your program. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate that, John, and continue listening and stay safe on the road. Um, Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I, I guess we got a an idea uh <laughs> to take back to the to the home base larry because I, I i can see the the significance of that because it would make a fisher um you know kind of incentivized to throw the fish back and be able to keep track of uh big big john that he caught right off of vicksburg um uh, and 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 want to see if it made it to meridian or something like that I, I agree. Yes, I think it would be interesting uh, uh, to to show the movement of the fish as they're being recaptured. So um, I know years ago, a few years, well, maybe it's 10 years ago, you kind of lose track of time, but we had a study going on in Sawyer and they were in their movement and, uh, or, and uh, put locations on the maps of the, where the crappie were moving around. That was a very popular feature. So I can see where if we display the movement of these catfish, I think that would be very interesting too. So I appreciate that suggestion. Oh, and um, I know we're coming up on the last few minutes of the show. I wanted to make sure, Bob, um, if people want to get in touch with you for Blue Cat Guide, because you can kind of guide them on trying to catch these tracked fish and actually show them what to do when it's time to call that number and, and, and track the proper information. How can uh, people get in touch with you for uh, Blue Cat Guide? Well, I have a website, uh, bluecatguideservice.com. And all my information, the contact information is on there. But uh, also, my phone number is uh, 601 953 And uh, if anybody just wants to call and talk catfishing, I just love uh, visiting with other anglers and discussing it. So if you want to go fishing, call me. If you just want to talk catfishing, give me a call. Well, that's a that I, I really appreciate you um, putting that that number out there. And if you want to go visit the website, because as of now, um, like Larry said, that they're looking for your help, other anglers and people who are fishing on the Mississippi River to get these fish, track these fish, so we can collect this data and um, and and see what comes of it. We have another call on the line, and it's actually a pet question uh, for Doctor Major. Let's see what Debbie in Wesson um, has for us this morning. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning, and it's not necessarily a pet question, but it is a question for Dr. Troy. Okay, go ahead. Dr. Troy, do you like to fish? That's a great question. Uh, I have not been fishing in quite a while. I intend to take advantage of uh, the Blue Cat Guide Service before long with my grandson. Well, I have a suggestion. And, uh, I have a suggestion yes. for you then. They can tag them. You can tattoo them and maybe get a free tri- fishing trip out of it. <laughs> 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 and then no. if they do travel and someone else catches them, then maybe they won't be tempted to keep them because they're tattooed. Interesting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, have a good day. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye bye. Did I miss something, Doctor Major? Are you a tattoo artist? Uh, we we've done some tattoos on 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 pets, you know, uh, indicating that they've been uh, neutered or spayed. Plus, uh, we also have done some in the past, not recently, but uh, actually a tattoo in the ear with some with some ID, uh, the microchip. Uh, which I recommend uh, for pets, uh, for it can be read. But, you know, a tattoo in the ear is pretty obvious, and uh, certainly uh, that can be done. But the advent of the microchip in the last 20 years has <laughs> cut down on the tattoo business. Well, 
Oh, okay. Because that's I, I thought I missed a, uh, <laughs> another one of your many, many talents. It's funny that you would say that um, about the microchipping. Just the other day, my brush with nature was a um, a neighbor's dog got loose, and I honestly did not know that this neighbor had a dog, and we were um, we were you know kind of two steps away from taking someone's pet to animal rescue because uh, they were just in our yard and a friendly dog, but we didn't know who or what she belonged to. Didn't have any identifying uh, marks on her. And I know with the, with the tattoo that you just said, or the microchip, that would be a, a you know, an easy, an easy fix for uh, dogs that get loose. Yes. And it is recommended for dogs and cats, the microchip. And it's, I would say that all veterinarians probably have what's called a microchip reader. And most of the rescue groups have that as well. Yeah, that was, it was really, well. like I said, we were two steps because she had just had puppies when we took her back to the, um, to the neighbor's house. She said, oh, she got 10 puppies in the bag. We didn't know how she oh got loose. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, I'm, Dr. Major, if you were at my house <laughs> the other day, you would have. Uh, yeah, it was it was a sight to be to be seen. I'll bet. I'll y- bet. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Um, Larry, um, we were talking about the blue cat guide and uh, Bob taking people out on the river to catch these tracked fish. Um, do do you have the number that people can? Um, uh, get in touch with the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks if they want to uh, see what kind of role they can play with this project? Sure, yes. Uh, they can call the Fisheries Bureau at 601-432-2200. And okay. I believe that's the number that's on the tag. Okay, also. okay. And if they catch this fish, are there uh, directions on the tag to, to for them to know to track where they caught the fish and the, the length and the weight, or do they call the number and then they'll get those instructions? Yeah, no, there's not enough room to put a lot of information <laughs> on those tags. You know, they're not. So uh, uh, the phone number and the, and the unique number, and I think it says MDWFP, and the phone number and the unique number, the tag number itself is on the tag. Uh, so hopefully if folks catch it, they call it immediately, you know, call us while they're on the water. That'd be great. And that way we could, you know, kind of direct them as to kind of the kind of information we'd like to have. Uh, as far as the location goes, I would like to point out if, if somebody can get the GPS coordinates, that would be great. Because that way we can really pinpoint the location where that fish was recaptured. Okay. And uh, also, also remind them the, the total length of the fish and also the weight, if they can get that, as well as the tag numbers. All right. Well, we'll make sure we put a lot of this information up with the podcast um, that people can reach at mpbonline.org uh, so they'll know the steps and the instructions to take when they catch these tagged fish. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the show, and we have one final caller. I don't want to put a lot of pressure on Joe, but Joe from Memphis, make it good. We're running up on the end of the show. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you. I just have a quick question. I got into your show late, so you may have already answered it. Um, were these catfish that you tagged raised in a hatchery? And if they were, how long did it take for them to get to 20 pounds? Uh, no, these were wild fish in the Mississippi River. Uh, they were um, caught right out of the Mississippi River, so they're, no, they're not in a hatchery or anything. They're just native wild fish in the Mississippi River. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and oh, I guess let me ask this question too, Bob. It's I always think about that because we are in catfish country. Uh, but do you eat these uh, fish that come out of the Mississippi River? Oh yes, sir. I, I I don't eat the big fish. I think it's a shame to kill something, um, you know, that that old. But uh, if we catch eating size fish, you know, ten pounds or less, um, they're they're great eating. I encourage people to keep them. Okay, okay. I always wonder because if you get a if you get a 40, 40, 50 pounder out of the water, I mean, it probably can go a long way. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a lot of fish, but uh, and some people insist on it's their fish. If they want to keep it, they can. But um, 
I really encourage people to return the big fish and release them. Just don't don't kill our big fish. Well, we appreciate you uh, this morning, Bob and Larry, for joining the show. And make sure you check out the podcast, mpbonline.org. We'll have more information about this program where they are looking for your help as they are tracking these tagged big blue catfish, big channel, uh, um, the big flatheads of Mississippi River. And make sure you check out the repeat at 6 o'clock in the morning right here on Creature Comforts. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. Funding is provided in part by listeners like you to hear today's show and previous shows. Visit mpbonline.org. I'm Java Chapman, and for our guests today, Bob Crosby, Larry Bull, and Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, we'll see you next Thursday, 9 a.m., right here on Creature Comforts, only on MPB Think Radio.